Right, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully this will work out to be quite a nice uh, follow-on from the uh, NFT conversation, because I'm not going to talk about them. Well, not very much, anyway. Um, I'll talk about them a little bit. So yeah, I'm Gareth. Uh, I've been uh, doing this for a while. A <laughs> uh, little bit of intro on the, on the sort of context of this talk, and then I'm going to dive right in, because it, it's pretty specific and detailed. So way back when, 2014, I was talking about blockchain games and uh, describing all these things that you could do when players owned things. And uh, I assumed that everyone would kind of follow along and say, OK, that's really cool. Because of ownership, we can do this. And, and because of blockchain tech, we can do that. And that, that's not really happened, to be perfectly honest. And it's only now we're starting to have these conversations where we're saying, what, what actually, are we, why are we doing it this way? So what I thought I'd do is take one of those really specific areas that I was thinking about then uh, and, and describe it. Um, this, this idea of um, a, a player service economy, which uh, I guess hopefully throughout the talk will we'll kind of take shape and uh, there'll be some form around it that you can, uh, that you can start to think about. Um, I suspect this, this sort of concept will get revised over time. I'll probably write this up at some point, but this is a kind of introduction to it. So what's a player service economy? Uh, well, let's break that down. Um, start with the service bit. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, service is generally something where one person is doing something for somebody else. Either because they don't have the time to do it, or they can't do it, or they, they just want assistance in, in doing it. There's also normally a, a transfer of value associated with delivering a service, typically. Uh, okay, so what's a player? Well, let's, let's describe that as what players do, because it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a broad term. Um, I'm specifically talking about interesting games here. Um, I, I'm not going to give examples, but I, I'm not talking about casual games or trivial games. I'm talking about actual serious video games. Uh, let's have a look at what players do. So here are four examples of things that players do in games. Things that take time, thing, things that take resources, things that take skills, and uh, things that require availability. And that, that last one... Is, is pretty nuanced in the video games world. It doesn't actually happen very often because of how traditional games work. Um, there are a couple of examples of MMOs that pull this off. Uh, EVE is by far the best example, um, but the, the availability component is, is dependent on social structures. Um, it, it doesn't come about by design with the game. It's actually come as a result of how people engage with it and people build friendships, and the, these friendships leads, leads to these social structures that support availability, but th there aren't that many examples of games that actually have that. I'll come back to that at the end because I think it's really interesting. The other things are all pretty self-explanatory uh, in terms of what they are. Um, you could also add to that list if you wanted to. Um, knowledge is, a, is an, another good one. Status, uh, cooperation. There's lots of different aspects that you could pick and say, OK, these are things that the players do. But I, I'm just going to cover the, the four that uh, I've spoken about. OK, and what's an economy? There's lots of different definitions of what an economy is. Uh, most of them relate pretty well to what I'm talking about, so I'm not going to go into it in a huge amount of detail. But here's, here's one definition. An economy is a, a large set of interrelated uh, production and consumption activities uh, that aid in determining how, to, how scarce resources are allocated. Um, that's from Investopedia. A, a lot of generic descriptions of what an economy is are, are some version of this um, that you can get, obviously, a lot more detailed. So let's put that in the context of a, a player service economy and the things that I've just spoken about. And this is, this is massive, massively simplifying it, but it, it works. A set of interrelated activities that determine how player time is allocated. So what I'm talking about here is in that, in that group of four things, um, the economy is really the, the, the actions that take place or the, the, the interrelationships between systems um, that determine how a player's time is, is allocated in that world. There's a really specific part of this that I want to point out, which is I'm talking about player time across all of the games that they play and the other things that they do in their life. Um, this, in the video games industry now, this is pretty commonly spoken about as player time is it, it, it's, a, it's seen as being competitive to other uh, pastimes. Uh, Netflix's biggest competitor is Fortnite, all of this kind of stuff. I'm talking about this very much in that kind of context. I'm not saying you've got a player who's inside of one game and then choosing how to spend their time. I'm talking about players choosing to spend their time in lots of different games and other activities. There are obviously some examples, and I guess he's quite a good one, where, pl where players will only play one game and they, they won't interact with other games, but that, that's more of a different type of pastime than gaming generally. Okay, so what's blockchain got to do with this? 
Uh, why, why is this relevant from a blockchain perspective? Now, m maybe this is obvious, uh, maybe it's not, so I'm going to explain a little bit from at least my perspective why blockchain is related. Uh, I happen to be working on something that does all of this, by the way. I was originally going to demo that, uh, but I'm just not ready to demo yet, so I figured I'm just going to talk about it instead. instead. I'll give some examples in a little bit, but uh, what's blockchain got to do with it? Uh, uh, okay, so currency, money, services, and goods. I'm not, I'm not going to go back through defining all these. If you understand what they are, great. If you don't, hopefully it's apparent through what we're talking about. There is a difference between currency and money, critically. Um, but you, you're dependent on there being some money and a form of transferring it, i.e. currency, uh, when you talk about services um, or purchase of goods and transfer of goods. Uh, we're, we're presuming here that, and this is going back to this point about player time, we're presuming here that for, for serious play, um, players requiring a service are comparing the cost of that service or whatever it is that get, they're going to give over to receive the service to something that has real world value. And this is, this is super important. So if you're comparing this to something that has real-world value and you're transferring that value, um, it doesn't work if you use an in-game virtual currency. Um, the reason it doesn't work is because the in-game virtual currency has no real-world value. So uh, as much as some games developers would like to create systems that do this, it doesn't work. And when, talk, when I say virtual currency, I mean actual virtual currency, not cryptocurrency or anything like that. I'm talking about actual virtual currency inside of a game. Uh, the only ex exception here is if you somehow provide a mechanism by which that virtual currency can have real-world value. Um, that's generally not possible to do legally, but it has happened many times over. World of Warcraft's the oldest and probably best example of this. And then potentially you can put yourself in a situation where there's, there's some economic components to how the players are choosing to use that virtual currency, but often they're not sustainable and uh, they're very difficult to plan for. You can't participate in them typically as the developer or publisher of the game. Uh, it also couldn't work with tokens for, for mostly the same reason, but there's some other reasons as well, and people have spoken about this already today. You can't use a token that someone's invested in speculatively to transfer value when acquiring a service. It just doesn't work. People make decisions that are based on the speculative value of the token, not of the service that they're acquiring, so on and so forth. Um, and that doesn't matter whether it's a token that you've created for your game or whether it's some platform or network token. It just, it just doesn't work. And the last one, and by far the most important one, you can't do this with real money and existing payment systems. And the reason you can't do it is mostly a legal one. Uh, and I, I could do a whole talk on this. Uh, I'm not going to because it's very, very boring. But basically, you cannot have a situation where there's a central, central intermediary in a financial tra transaction between two persons. You can't have player A pay player B via some central intermediary without that central intermediary being a money transfer business. Business. And if you know anything about the world of cryptocurrency, then you're probably familiar with these kind of basic concepts. Uh, theoretically, you could have a game developer publisher register as an MSB and operate an MSB-like business, but it's going to put off the players almost immediately because the hoops that you have to go through to actually conduct these transactions are going to be very similar to the ones that you would have to do if you're interacting with your bank uh, or your favorite uh, cryptocurrency exchange. So this doesn't work. Um, and obviously, and sort of getting to the point here, it does work with blockchain. So cryptocurrency can be sent directly between players. Um, it might be money. I'm not going to get into that whole conversation. Um, it certainly can be used to build money. And this comes back onto the conversation that was happening in the NFT panel and, and before uh, about DeFi and uh, using uh, decentralized finance type uh, mechanisms in, inside of games. And that's specifically what I'm going to lead to here. So let's have a quick look at what that would look like. Um, at the top, you've got value. Uh, DAI is the best example here of what you would use right now to transfer value in a, in a, uh, a sort of neutral manner. There's no, it's, it's pegged to the US dollar. US dollar is a stable currency. Uh, there's no speculation associated with the acquisition of DAI. There are, there are maybe patterns of behavior around how people acquire it and why they've acquired it that, that you need to sort of be aware of, but that's just because it's a very new concept and people's interaction with it tends to be biased around why they've acquired it in the first place. Having said that, evidence is showing in the entire sort of DAI and DeFi space that actually people who are acquiring it want to use it. They want to do stuff with it, and that, that's really exciting. 
Uh, you could. I've also put ETH, Bitcoin, NFTs up there. You could use these to transfer value, and, and, and people do. Bitcoin and ETH are both used as money in lots and lots of different situations. And you could theoretically do it with NFTs as well. Um, I'm not going to spend a long time defining how you would do that, but um, there were some examples that came up earlier uh, as, as to how you might have NFTs be the, the value transfer or exchange mechanism. In the middle, we've got smart contracts. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to go into a definition of what smart contracts are, but these could be provided by the game, they could be provided by third parties, or they could be provided directly by players. And at the bottom, we've got game state. I'm kind of mostly talking here about games that have some blockchain-based state, but that wouldn't actually need to be the case. You, you could just do this with a, a regular game if you wanted to. Uh, the cool thing about having on-chain state or having some Oracle service is that you can make these completely deterministic service uh, contracts, which uh, I'll give some examples of in a moment. And then obviously on the, on the right there, you've got players connecting all of this uh, together. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick example. Uh, this is from what I'm working on, Lunar Mines, um, but I've used it deliberately just to kind of put some words around those four examples that I gave earlier. So, uh, players uh, build mining infrastructure. It's a skilled activity, um, and to produce efficient outcomes, you have to be skilled, basically. Uh, players extend the known galaxy by sending probes. That requires resources. Um, players find routes through the galaxy by hacking into this network that's, that connects things together. That takes time. There's all, also a skills component to that, but it, more significantly, it takes time. Uh, and players maintain those routes by defending uh, the nodes and interfaces that they've hacked into, and that requires availability. The game is always on. It's a massively multiplayer single universe, and once you've created this network of nodes that you can route things through, uh, you have to defend against attacks on that that come from within the game itself in a sort of PvE style way. Uh, but those could come at any time, so you have to make yourself available. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Well, it's pretty straightforward. The efficient mining infrastructure, there are design contests. Those design contests execute inside of smart contracts that read the state of the game and allow players to pay each other either using DAI or ETH. All of that happens on the Ethereum network. Uh, the game is providing an Oracle service into that that has the outputs of the contest, though theoretically people could build that service themselves anyway because the, the state's all on the blockchain as well. Uh, we just provide a, a service to do it. Uh, supply contracts, uh, this is pretty straightforward. It's probably the, the most basic example. Sending resource to, resources to other parts of space. Uh, you can set up a supply contract saying I require X resource at Y place at Z point in time, and the first person to satisfy that gets paid out automatically on the, on the smart contract. Defense contracts, uh, this is my favorite example and by far the coolest one. You can put up bounties to defend your, uh, your nodes that you've hacked on your network so that when someone comes along and tries to hack into them or the PVE system, it's mostly PVE, so you're, you're actually defending against the game itself. Uh, when that happens, you can, you can have a bounty associated with that defense contract and some other player can come in and say, I can do that and I'm available. They log in, they do it, and then they get paid out. Uh, and then the last one is more of a permits type system where when you've got these nodes in space, and they're all connected together, you can choose how you want other people to be able to use them. And the more people that use them, the more work it takes to defend them. So there's a kind of risk reward thing there. So presumably if you're gonna let a lot of people use your nodes, then you charge them to do it so that you can pay other people to defend them when they get hacked. Uh, okay. So, all I've done there is connected those back together. Hopefully this is pretty straightforward and, uh, and apparent by now, but tasks that require time, resources, availability, or skills, all interwoven together in this, in this player service economy. Now, the, the, the example I just gave was a player service economy for Lunar Mines, but it could be a player service economy for, for lots of different things. As it happens, Lunar Mines, the, the design of the game is based around all of this stuff. It was, it was based on me saying, okay, what can I do with blockchain that I, I couldn't do without? And then I designed an entire game around it. So it happens to have some really cool examples, but you, you could do it differently. You could, you could take small slices of this and apply them to either traditional games or other blockchain games. And I think there's also some cool things you could do with NFT type games or games that rely on these collectibles. I'm just going back to this, just as a reminder, the bottom you've got the state of the game. Not absolutely mandatory, but it's cool if you've, if you've done it that way. Uh, the top you've got the value transfer, die is a good example, but you could use others. And in the middle you've got smart tr contracts that glue, glue all of this together. Interestingly, these things don't all necessarily have to be on the same network either. You, can, you could have these attached across different networks and in, different, in different ways. 
Uh, okay, so going back to the beginning, player service economy is a set of interrelated activities that determine how player time is allocated. Uh, and I've added at the bottom there, for which blockchain I happen to think is uniquely uh, well suited. Um, you can't do this without, uh, and maybe there's other ways you could kind of glue it all together, but there's no, there's no viable legal or technical way to do this without, without blockchain. Uh, and for that reason, I think it's uh, something worth talking about, and I think people should be building cool stuff uh, based on these principles. So, thanks very much. I think I've got like a couple of minutes for questions. So, I'll ask a question. So, Lunar Mines, you hope to have something, but you haven't quite done it yet. What's the current roadmap for? Uh, come ask me in May if you want to see it. Come ask me in May. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say anything about like actual release dates or no, when no, it might I, be I, done, I, but no. um, I, I will be. I, I'm, I could kind of show stuff now, but I'm not going to. So, yeah. And people, the, the website's still up, isn't it? Yeah, you can yeah. sign up for, sign like, up. A, if you put your email address yeah. in, you'll get, you'll yeah. get some news. Cool. There's Any also some, there's some hidden stuff out there that I haven't spoken about that you might be able to find if you're oh. super interested. Oh. So, yeah. Easter eggs. Okay, any, any questions? As ever with Gareth's talk, there's an awful lot in there, and it takes, you, <laughs> it takes me the next hour to, to that's what he meant. Mm. Um, so well, hopefully I'll write, like I said at the beginning, I'll probably write this up in the next month or so with a oh. bit more detail and some okay. more examples.